All right, so hello everyone again. Welcome back to our class. So we are on uh, the IO or persistence unit of our textbook. And last time we discussed the, an overview of IO devices. So for this chapter, uh, we're going to talk about uh, hard disk drives. So what are these hard disk drives, okay? So as you know already, the hard disk drives are slowly becoming or slowly getting obsolete because most of the drives that we have today are SSDs, which basically has a different way of storing things. Remember that hard disk drives are IO devices that are used to for storage. So it's basically secondary storage. And in the case, let's say, of the virtual memory wherein we have uh, demand paging, the hard disk drive is usually the storage area for uh, for pages or frames that are not in the main memory. Now, despite the hard disk drives uh, slowly getting obsolete, uh, why should we study this device? The first one is uh, it has been used for a long time already before the invention or before the appearance of the SSDs, HDDs were actually used, right? Now, uh, 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 a weaker version of HDD is the floppy disk, right? F, uh, FDD, floppy disk drives, right? So it uses uh, somehow, uh, it's more lightweight, but it allows you to store information, but in uh, smaller amounts, like what you did in the uh, bootlo uh, bootloader lab activity. Now, also, in addition to being used for a long time, HDDs actually uh, is important because most of the file systems, which we will discuss in the succeeding chapters, are predicated on the behavior of the HDD. So it's an I.O. device. So it has it's different from uh, the CPU and from the memory. So it behaves differently. It has a different function. but when we talk about file systems, usually we, uh, we have to understand somehow how the actual device works. So HDD is a good, is, since it's been used a long time, then probably most of the development in file systems is basically predicated on the behavior of the hard disk drive. Now let's talk about the HDD interface. Right? So the HDD interface, uh, if you look at the, the way uh, it is presented to the processor, it's basically divided into uh, sectors, right? And sectors are five, typically will have 512 uh, byte uh, blocks, right? So yung some sector, parang basic, uh, uh, the size of a sector, the basic unit size is 512 bytes so for the sector. And this is where data is actually uh, stored on the hard disk drive. Therefore, we can think of the disk as simply an array of sectors, right? And each sector has 512 bytes, it can store 512 bytes. Now, the hard disk also can operate on uh, multiple sectors. So let's say you want to read, uh, it's not always that you read and, and write uh, 512 bytes only or one sector. It's also possible to write or read in chunks, right? The hardware or the circuitry of the hard disk uh, can support that. However, the manufacturer, right? The, the man, for example, Seagate, Western Digital, right? Uh, can only guarantee a 512 byte atomic byte, meaning, once the write is initiated, uh, it is guaranteed that 512 bytes will be written to the disk. Right? So otherwise, uh, it may not write successfully. Right? So when that happens, it's called a torn write. And uh, basically, it just means partial or broken. So let's say uh, you the you requested to write or the the process requested to write uh, 
1024 bytes that that would be two sectors right now it's possible that that only the first sector will get uh, will be written to the disk while the other sector will not be completely written to the disk so there is a partial or broken byte right so when we think of hdd we have to consider uh, we think of sectors or sometimes actually it's called blocks blocks are a collection of sectors so we can say at the, at the basic level, one block equals one sector, or in some advanced formats, we can have one block equal to multiple sectors. So, but the unit that is being manipulated is one block, right? I hope you get the idea. Now let's talk about the geometry of the hard disk. How does this hard disk look like, right? So we have different components. I, I think this, an overview of this uh, geometry has been discussed in the bootloader lab. So we have the platter, which is the circular, uh, this is a circular hard surface. Right? So, uh, and then we have the spindle, which uh, bounds the platters. And then we also have a metric called RPM, which, me which means rotations per minute. So of course you have a hard disk that it will uh, you have uh, the platter and the platter will uh, rotate right and the rotations per minute is part of the specification of the hard disk drive. So the typical RPM for a disk will be seven thousand two hundred rotations per minute to fifteen thousand rotations per minute. Right? And then uh, we have tracks. Okay? Tracks are concentric, uh, concentric circles of sectors. Uh, so if you have a, a disk, so the platter is divided into smaller uh, concentric circles, right? And uh, each of these circles represent, represents a, a, a track. And within these tracks, we have sectors. Then we have uh, the head of the head, okay? So the head is the actual uh, component of the hard disk that performs the reading or uh, the writing using elect uh, physics, electromagnetic uh, transmission, right? electromagnetic signals. Right? So it's just the head component. And then the arm is the one that moves across the surface to position the head over the desired track. So you have the head and the head is attached to the arm. So you can think of uh, the head as the hands and the arm, uh, the arm, right? So, yeah, it's the idea. And, uh, Okay, so I took this picture from how stuff works and just to, for you to be able to get a, an inside look of a hard disk uh, drive. But if you have old hard disk drives, you can open them and then you can see all these components. In ICS, we have a lot of, uh, I've done this, I've opened a lot of hard disk and tried to view these components, but here they are. So you have here uh, multiple platters, for example, and then you have the arm and then you have the head then rotating uh, the, uh, across the uh, uh, spindle, right? So this is a typical illustration of a hard disk drive. So, so it has a mechanical component. So it has a moving part, right? Unlike in SSDs where there, there are no moving parts, right? Here it has moving parts. So you, sometimes you have to be careful with when handling this so that uh, you will not uh, dislocate the placement of the platters, for example. So you just you can just throw away a, and then uh, uh, throw away a hard disk uh, without being careful, right? So so here are other illustration. Now let's look at a simple model of a disk drive to be able to understand how it works. So here is uh, uh, an abstract view of a hard a hard disk. So you have the spindle, and then you have here an example of a hard disk with a single track. And these are the blocks or the sectors. Okay, so we have a single track, and then we have one, uh, one, two, three, up to we have twelve uh, sectors here per track. And then this is the arm, and then we have the head here. So currently, the head is uh, on top of sector or block six. Right. So this is a simple configuration of a disk drive. And uh, let's since we're going to use this as an example. Let's see how, how it operates. So let's say this is the latest configuration. And of course, let's say a process will request 
uh, for a read of uh, a data file and the data file is in the in the disk right and the device driver will, was able to identify that that this for example hello.txt is located on uh, sector zero or block zero now if this is the latest configuration of the drive how should uh, the disk handle this uh, read of sector zero so of course, uh, given this configuration, the idea is that the plotter will rotate until sector zero is under the head. So we only have a single trap. So the main, main movement will be a rotation. So the plotter will rotate. So of course, the, the mounting of the arm is fixed. So the arm cannot move around. It is the disc that will rotate. So eventually the... Uh, this uh, based on the configuration, the rotation is uh, counterclockwise. So this, uh, the platter will rotate until eventually block or sector zero is under uh, the head. And that after that, there will be the, that will be the time that the actual read will happen, right? So the time it takes for the, for the platter to rotate is called the, rotational delay. So on the average, actually, the rotational delay will be uh, half for this particular read. Right? For this particular read, the average rotational delay will be half. Right? Because as you can see, uh, if we have a, the complete a rotational delay will be one rotation. But for zero to be able to move to the under the head, it has to uh, have r over two, half of the rotational delay. Okay. Now, let's complicate things further. What if we have multiple tracks? Okay. So this is the real scenario. We have multiple tracks actually on the disk. Okay. So let's say we have this latest configuration now of uh, of a disk with multiple tracks. So how many tracks do we have? One, two, three. We have three tracks and as you can see, uh, it's possible that the number of blocks per track will actually be, will not be the same for all the tracks. Since, for example, the outermost track has, has a wider area, it's possible to actually have more number of blocks outside on the outermost track, right? as you can see. But in this illustration, I think they made it consistent that all the tracks will have the same number of blocks but for example if you take this block it's possible to have more sectors in this particular block okay so please take note of that uh, okay uh, so let's say that given this latest configuration we tried to request uh, the process uh, requested or the device driver okay, requested to read sector 11 okay so sector 11 from this given configuration is of course in the outermost track, right? So how is this going to happen? So the first step is of course to move the, uh, the head to the outermost track, okay? So move the disc arm to the outermost track. So it's basically the, it will just rotate, right? Move it, move here, right? And then, that the time to move the arm or the head from one track to another is called the seek time. Okay, so the other one, rotational delay, this one is the seek time. And uh, essentially, the phase, there will be four, uh, four, four phases in the seek time. First, the acceleration. Then you, you have the coasting then the cell, the deceleration, and then the settling. So these are the phases during uh, seek time because our goal is to move the arm, the disc arm, which basically has the head, where the head is attached, from the innermost track to the outermost track. So by doing that, the arm will have to accelerate for a while, and then after the acceleration, it will coast for a while, and then it will decelerate, and then it will settle. So four phases. Okay. So an important thing to remember is that the platter can also rotate while the 
this arm is moving, right? So while the arm is moving towards the last, the outermost trap, it's also possible that the, the platter is also moving at the same time. So as you can see here in this configuration, after the sick time, block 11 is already in this position. Unlike in the latest configuration, where in the block 11 is still in this position, right? So this is essentially what, what can happen, right? So I hope you understand that. So at least you have to, be, to, to differentiate rotational delay and seek time. Then the next one is the track skew. So track skew, uh, sometimes you, uh, you need to compensate, okay? Compensate for the seek. So normally the proper way to do it is you have uh, some alignment, okay? so direct alignment, right? Direct alignment with 11, 23, 35, 12, 24, 13, 25, right? So those are the alignment. Now for, uh, for the track skew, it's possible to provide some uh, skew or advancement, right? So you put in some, uh, you put some of the tracks ahead, two positions here, right? So you advance uh, the, the position of the blocks within the sector, right? So 11, 23, 35. So as you can see here uh, uh, in the, this configuration, 11, instead of 23 being under here, it is moved uh, further down here, right? To compensate for that. Another uh, thing is multi-zone, meaning uh, each zone is composed of a set of consecutive tracks, right? So in order again to improve uh, some perform the performance, you can group, okay? Uh, okay? You can group, uh, let's say 14 and four as a, a zone, a single zone, so that the movement will happen uh, by zone, okay? That's the idea. Okay, and uh, yeah, okay. Now, the data is stored on the disk is usually uh, cache, right? So the circuitry of the hard disk drive has a cache or a track, a track buffer, okay? Where in the data before being sent to the main memory will is placed actually on the cache or the track buffer. So we can have a write back, okay? So in the write back, uh, let's say uh, a request was uh, sent to the, to the disk. Okay, write this at block four, okay? Now that request or the data to be stored on block four can be stored on this uh, cache track. Now, now, if the device acknowledges that, Okay, that is called write back. Even though the data is just in the cache, the acknowledgement is made already. So this is called a write back. Now, the other one is if the data, the, if the acknowledgement is made, the acknowledgement would mean, okay, I've written, I've committed it, or I've written it to this. Okay, so if just in the buffer, it's called a write back. You acknowledge even if it's just in the buffer, the data is in just in the buffer, it's called the write back. But if you acknowledge only after actually writing the contents to the disk, then it's called a write through, okay? So that's uh, the difference between uh, write back and write through. Okay, so the next item on our discussion is how long does it take to do an IO on a hard disk drive? So obviously, by experience, compared to SSDs, okay, so if you have a system with uh, an SSD drive and an HDD drive, normally you place the operating system on the SSD drive, right? And uh, the data on the HDD, right? And you observe a, a better performance of your system if you have that configuration. Now let's take a look at how long does it take to do an IO on an HDD. So there are two uh, values or two metrics that you need to consider. It's called, the first one is called the transfer time. And the other one is the transfer rate. 
The transfer time or I-O transfer time is equal to the seat time, as we discussed earlier, the movement, the moving of the arm from one track to another, the rotation right, within uh, the rotation of the platters, and the actual uh, transfer. So those are the components that uh, affect, or these are the times that affect the total I-O transfer time for a hard disk drive. Now, of course, if you have an SSD, SSD, probably you'll already recognize that there are no seek time or no rotation time, rotation delay component on the I/O time. Right? And then the transfer rate is just the uh, the ratio of the uh, size of the actual transfer. So usually you have to specify a size, uh, the amount of data that you would like to transfer, divided by the transfer time. So in the textbook, there was a, there's an illustration of uh, a comparison of two disk drives from uh, Seagate, the Cheetah and the Barracuda. Right? And there's a comparison uh, between two types of workloads. We have the random and sequential. What do we mean by random workload? When you say random workload, say you have a file, let's say uh, a one gig file. Right? Of course, that one gig file, if you have, if you're going to read that, if that one gig file is stored on the disk, it's possible that they are not in stored in contiguous, uh, in contiguous blocks, right? So it's possible that they are not uh, stored in contigu contiguous sectors, right? So the, the disk will have to find the different pieces of that large file and bring them together, right? That is, so the operation will, will be random. But for sequential, uh, we have the, uh, the reading of the disk blocks uh, is uh, contiguous. Meaning, for example, uh, they are close to each other, right? So uh, in the comparison presented in the textbook, these two, uh, these two drives, hardest drives, were, uh, were, will have different characteristics. Cheetah, will be for performance, and then Barracuda will be for capacity, right? And then for the comparison, so these are the specs, no? When you buy a hard disk, right? So let's say uh, you think uh, I, 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 you're going to upgrade your hard disk, right? right? So normally you have to check the, this specification. Sometimes you just, most people will just consider the capacity, right? So I want a one TB uh, hard disk drive, and uh, I want, or a, a, I have a, a 300 gigabyte drive. For example, nowadays, if you buy, uh, that's why you have a combination of SSD and uh, HDD is because during the early days of SSD, you have a very, uh, you have a small capacity, right? Whereas an HDD has a higher capacity, but these are some of the specs for comparison as presented in the book, right? So you have the max transfer, right? Uh, 125, uh, this is a transfer rate, maximum transfer rate, uh, uh, 125 Mbps for Cheetah and 105 Mbps for Paracuda. Number of platters for four, cache, right? The cache buffer, track buffer, and the connection, right? The interfaces, CASI or SATA. Uh, so, Illustrated in the textbook is the computation for the, or how to derive the, uh, for the TIO, okay? So you have uh, the seek time. So this, the seek time is, see this one component uh, is already given. So this one, the average seek, so four milliseconds. And then the next one is you have to compute the rotational latency, okay? The time, for a single rotation. How long does it take for a single rotation? So how do we compute that? We are given the specification of RPM, right? So 15,000 RPM. So we simply place that here, 15,000 rotations per minute RPM. Then uh, we do some uh, mathematics. I think you are familiar with this. So because we are interested in finding the milliseconds, so we simply uh, multiply that uh, one minute has uh, 60 seconds to cancel the unit. So we have 15,000 rotations divided by 60 seconds with the total, but 
we are interested in the number of rotations per uh, the number the time per rotation right so we have which is milliseconds so we have to, again to cancel seconds one seconds 1000 milliseconds and we're going to arrive at this uh, final value 0.25 rotations per milliseconds right but we are interested in the number of milliseconds per rotation right so simply div uh, one divided by point uh, point two hundred by one so you get uh four by four uh one divided by uh, 0.25 you get four milliseconds per rotation so this will be the value for the rotational delay so uh no for uh yeah uh, no, for, for the total, okay, for the entire rotational delay. So this is the entire rotational delay. And you have to get the average. So again, it's over two, right? So R over two, so four by two, so you have two milliseconds. And then the transfer rate, right? So the transfer rate is computed. So you have the maximum transfer here. And uh, so that will be four kilobytes. And then divided by, since we are using kilobytes, Yung ating, uh, our given is uh, four kilobyte read. This is again for random, right? This is for random. So four kilobyte convert the MB to uh, kilobyte. So what, uh, 125 MB is uh, equal to 128,000 KB per second. And you get this value. So the total, uh, so summing this up, four plus two plus transfer time, this will give us uh, this value, 6.03125 uh, milliseconds for the uh, T sub IO okay, of the Barracuda. And for the R sub IO, then simply divide the, uh, should be 4 KB, right? It should be 4 KB. And then you should have this value 0.66 MB per second. Okay, so uh, with uh, no, tama, this is correct. Okay, so one kilobyte per uh, uh, six point zero three one to five milliseconds. Okay, so, and then simply multiply that. With, this is KB. Okay, and then we get this value. So the rest of the computation uh, is just an exercise for you. But in the book, uh, we have the final result of the computation, right? So you have the RIO random for uh, cheetah 0.66 as we demonstrated here, okay? In the first second for the Barracuda, which we did not compute, we have this one. And for the sequential, okay, so the sequential is uh, basically just the same here, okay? So this, this is the same because uh, usually normally those are the tests that are being made. And this is the comparison. So what are the observations? So given this result, so observation one, there's a huge gap in the performance between randomized, random and sequential workloads, okay? So normally uh, the performance is better if you have sequential workloads. That's why the fragmentation is important uh, in disk maintenance, right? So when you defrag, you try to uh, bring the blocks together, right? So, because that will drastically improve the performance of your device, right? Another observation is that the high-end performance drive is better than the low-end capacity drive. Right? So, uh, when you're trying to scout for a new hard disk, the salesperson will tell you, ah, the capacity of this device is 2, two TB, right? So, you, you will probably buy that, but you don't usually look at the performance, right? But for some performance, this performance is important. So, but the idea is that the high end performance drive are always better than lower end capacity drives, right? And of course you have to pay a little bit more for high end performance drives, all right? Okay, so the last item is, I don't know, the last item is disk scheduling. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, in the previous lecture, normally only a single process can uh, 
perform an eye operation. If there are other processes that are trying to use the disk, for example, they have to wait, they have to queue. The request will actually be queued in a buffer, right? As presented in last time, uh, the source code for the IDE driver for XV6, there is a buffer there, which is basically a linked list that contains the queue, a queue, basically a queue that contains the request, right? To access the, the disk. Okay. So the component of the operating system responsible for that is called the disk scheduler. And what it does is examines uh, the request and decides uh, which one to schedule next. So it's very similar. The operation is very similar to the CPU scheduler. And uh, the main difference about CPU scheduling and this scheduling is that in the disk scheduler, you can actually predict the you can actually predict the the job length, right? Unlike in the CPU schedule, you, you don't you try you don't uh, you don't you can't easily predict the job length. So you try to guess that using some techniques, right? We discuss in the CPU schedule, but here in this schedule we can actually predict the job length because we have the seek time because we have the how we have the seek time we have we, we have the value for the rotational latency. So we simply, and we have a fixed block. So depending on the request, the number of blocks requested, then we can actually determine the job length, right? For that particular request, right? So basically we can just use shortest job first for that. Okay, so uh, we have some historical algorithms uh, discussed in the book. So for, these are not part, this, this, this example here is not in the book. Okay, but I just uh, took it from uh, IIT. This is a request, uh, example request. Now these numbers here represent the truck, the truck number. Okay? And then uh, this configuration, so this is the request queue. This is the, these are the trucks in the request queue. And then we have the head, okay? uh, currently pointing on truck 15. And then we have a tail truck, which is at uh, track number 199, okay, so the outermost track. So what are the algorithms I mentioned? We have the shortest seek time first, right? So in this configuration, the idea is to uh, go to the nearest track from the current, right? So for example, here we have, uh, in the book, we have this configuration. We have, uh, let's say this is the, the head, where the head is, and then it has to decide whether it will choose 21 or two. So it has to uh, basically go to the uh, nearer track. So of course the nearer track is uh, track two. So it will go, it will uh, grant the operation or read or write on this particular uh, sector. Okay, so it's also, uh, there's also a nearest block first when the disk geometry is unknown. So simply, since we have numbers here, sequential numbering, so you simply uh, look at the block that is closer to the to the current block that is under the head of the, the arm, under the head, right? So the question here is, is, is starvation possible in this shortest seek time first? The answer is yes. Why? Because if a lot of uh, request comes in all positioned in track two, okay? let's say after servicing a request, after reading 21, another request comes in and it is uh, for track number 20, uh, for, sec for block number 23, then eventually this one here, this request to access uh, block two will not be granted immediately because there are requests that are coming that are within this track, for example, or within the inner track. So the, re the process will, uh, that the process that requested to read or to access this block will start, right? So here are uh, illustrations for that. So uh, given this request, right? So it's short shortest seek time first. So this will be the configuration. So take note that these are track numbers, right? Uh, and then we also have the eleva elevator uh, algorithm. So what it does is from the current, right, it will go down 
up to the first floor and then it will move up up to the last floor so you can think of this as floors in a building now the c scan on the other hand will uh, go down to the first floor but it will move up to the topmost floor but it will not do anything as it passes by the other floors then when it goes down it, it that's a time that it will service the other request okay and then the other one is the c look c look scan the c look so what it does is it does not completely go to first floor only up to the last one so it's 11 and then goes up to the not necessarily the last floor the topmost floor and then goes down and service the request right so c look okay and then uh, are the above algos the, the best? The answer is no, because they only consider seek time. Of course, we also have to consider that rotational delay, right? So we have the shortest positioning time first, right? And this algorithm considers both the seek time and the rotational delay. So in this example, in the book, we have the current configuration here. Uh, the scheduler will have to decide, will it service the request for 8 or will it service the request for 16? So it depends because you have to consider the factors like seek time and rotation on delay. But the, the, this scheduler may not have that information. So uh, the decision will have to be made inside the circuitry of the drive or the basically the firmware, right? which is way below uh, a layer below than the uh, disk scheduler all right so for other issues uh where is the scheduling done as i mentioned it can be done by the schedule this scheduler which is part of the operating system if it has enough information if you can guess for example or the scheduling can be done at the disk level at the firmware firmware level okay now other issues include io merging so instead of uh, servicing one block request, why don't we group multiple blocks, right? And then perform the ac disk access after a certain uh, criteria is met, but you have more than one block right, before you eventually access the disk. Right? Then you also have work conserving and non-work conserving uh, 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 tasks by right? IO request, right? So uh, here's my laptop. You can use the Windows system information to get ac uh, access about your disk. So this is my laptop. So as you can see, this is, uh, I think it's Western Digital, part of the, my purchase of the Lenovo laptop. Uh, the bytes per sector is 512, okay? And then it's a fixed disk drive or hard disk drive. It's also called the fixed disk, fixed, fixed disk drive, fixed hard disk. And then the bus type is SCSI, okay? And this is the capacity of my laptop disk, right? And then you have the cylinder. So I, uh, we'll discuss cylinders later, but uh, the cylinder is basically uh, uh, created by uh, the multiple uh, platters. So you can see the information here. And then you have the number of tracks per cylinder. cylinder. And of course, my disk is partitioned into several uh, partitions. And as for the, I also have a tool called, I installed just uh, today, the GSmart to control, which allows uh, me to perform uh, more, uh, to obtain more information about my disk, right? I think I mentioned uh, before to you that my uh, hard disk is boot, my computer is very slow. So you can use GSmart control to monitor the, the performance, so, so you can see here the uh, different characteristics. So the rotation, the RPM of my disk is 5,400. Okay, so yeah, so probably I uh, slow. Okay, so when I purchased this, uh, when I purchased this uh, this laptop, I just look at the capacity. Okay, oh one TB. Right? I did not look at the RPM. <laughs> so next time when you purchase your uh, device, so in addition to the processor, i5 or the generation number, and then the amount of memory or the type of memory, you should also check the I.O. because uh, I.O. will usually be uh, uh, a bottleneck in your system. 
especially if you're doing a video, right? And you have the transfer rate, as I mentioned, okay? So you have the transfer rate here, right? So yeah, and there's a technology called SMART, right? The SMART technology. So uh, it somehow uh, provides additional features, right? Additional features about, uh, about the disk. So uh, some operating system support this SMART control, okay? So great, uh, that will be all for our uh, discussion today. Do you have any questions? We stop for I'll stop the recording. See for public at public nothing talk.